On November 13, 2007, the World Tongue Sudo Association celebrates its silver anniversary. Over its 25-year history, the association has grown from 164 charter members to a worldwide organization of martial artists with more than 100,000 members in 35 countries. Dedicated to the principles of traditionalism, professionalism, and brotherhood, the family of Tung Sudo spans the globe. And at the head of that family, one man, Grandmaster J. Chul Shin. And the story of the World Tung Sudo Association begins with his story many years ago in Korea. I started at a very young age, about 12. I was influenced by a monk in a temple, Buddhist temple, my mother used to attend. I saw outside amazing scenes, uh, one of a, a monk, a gray clothed uh, monk, and a flying kick uh, a branch of the trees. And I was uh, so impressed, so I, Time to time, I went there and uh, I trained. That time I moved to uh, school to the Seoul area. Then I found the uh, formal school, Tangsudo school, under uh, Master of Hwangi's school in uh, uh, Seoul. Passing by, I noticed the key ups and uh, uh, hard training. I watched the uh, class uh, through the window. That's why formal uh, beginning of my martial art. I was, after a Korea University chief instructor at that time, all Korean uh, college students has to serve in the military, mandatory. So uh, I was recruited as a uh, uh, Korean Air Force. As a martial art instructor, I assigned to the Osan Air Force Base. That was the major, largest American Air Force Base in Korea. I started to teaching military, Korean Air Force and American soldiers. We trained every night, Monday through Friday, and the classes were like three hours, seven to ten, six to nine, and uh, everybody trained together in the, in the club. It was a small, it was like a, a Quonset hut with the plywood floors and a heater and, and, and no dressing rooms. Most of the Koreans would leave their uniforms hanging on the wall. So as soon as you've got your orange belt and then you've got that uh, pin and you stuck that pin on and even though it had an orange belt on it, you were, you were walking downtown like this and if you were wearing the black belt, I mean, they had a black, oh man, you were just, you know, you could walk anywhere and people always gave you respect. In 1968, Grandmaster Shin came to the United States to spread the art further, opening a studio in Burlington, New Jersey and founding the United States Tung Sudo Federation. Quite a few uh, instructor and the masters whom I taught in Korea before 1968, they came here. They want to continue training, uh, so uh, that was the, uh, their decision to uh, get me in America. I went over there to a class after work one day and I was catching about the last half of the children's class. Kwan Jin was in early and I was watching the forms were very graceful but yet very powerful. The one steps were just precision timing. The, the self-defense was no nonsense, it was right to the point. They were doing free sparring toward the end. No one was getting killed but they were going like grease lightning, these little guys. So what I had seen is the best of all parts of everything that everyone else was doing all rolled into one package in one school. About all the part of the 70s, the karate studio was everywhere, mushroom. About 17 students to all of a sudden, a uh, couple hundred, for about a couple of months. So I was very, very busy. We were very special, I guess, because the first time I met Kwan Jin Im was at our orange belt test. He would always go to our, come to our gup test all the time, and it's, uh, you know, it's really amazing that he would just come to our gup test and, you know, and judge us. It was a gup test. Grandmaster Shin was conducting the gup test, and then after that, uh, Grandmaster Shin got up and he actually demonstrated in his suit. He threw a, seemed like a 250, 280 pound man across the room with this technique, and uh, I, I got to do this. So from that point on, I started and I never stopped.
The art was flourishing and new studios opening. The growing ranks of studio heads and instructors saw the need for a new organizational structure and went to the man they knew could provide the vision and leadership to make it happen. On November 13th and 14th, 1982, they assembled in Philadelphia to give birth to the new World Hung Sudo Association, recognizing Master J.C. Shin as Grand Master. Well, when we started a charter convention, about 164 black belt and 17 studio owners get together. Our uh, interesting is we are a small group. We have the same goal, same purpose. We get together, we share together, we train together, we enjoy together. That was the initiation of everybody's idea. There was a lot of people that desired his leadership, uh, his wisdom and insight, and we had already seen it through him coming over here in the United States. A lot of the instructors wanted to be with Master Shin. They wanted him to be the leader. And the convention was the point where everyone was coming together for the first time and throwing their support unconditionally with Grandmaster Shin. The momentum built up for the convention so that when it was time for the convention, it was just a great atmosphere. It was so exciting. The mood was that we were really creating something important, something new. And there were so many masters there and so many people, I mean, I was Chodon, and if you were a Chodon, that was something special. In, that, in those days, if you were an Edon, that was like, oh my God, Edon. If you were a Samdon, I mean, there were very few Samdon. And then to be in the presence of like 20 masters, 16, 20 masters, that was like unbelievable. And to be all there for a common purpose and train with them, that was pretty exciting, actually. The energy, uh, the excitement, uh, it felt very, very special to be part of it. This life was a dwell, was going up, and everyone's, ah, it's okay, fine, let's go. So I, I don't know where it's going to go, but uh, let's go uh, along with this. So it, it gave me also a good feeling. So uh, uh, ideal was the huge instructor together, we set the uh, uh, ideals, traditionalism, and we maintain our traditional uh, heritage value and uh, professionalism. Uh, we continuously uh, strive to teach more effectively. And most of all, uh, we like to stay together as a, a family, so a brotherhood. These are three uh, principal doctrines, and we adopt uh, uh, five codes as our conduct, main conduct and uh, seven tenants, uh, we all accepted and uh, we started uh, uh, new ideals. At the convention, everybody sat down and just decided on what the rules were gonna be and what we needed to keep this unity together. And most of it was the spirit and the communication between each other and that Master Shin would be our leader. At the charter convention, the association adopted a new constitution and insignia and it introduced new belt colors, including brown and Chodambo blue. When I started, uh, there was the white belt, and then there was, then there was the orange belt, and then there was green for a long time, and then there was red forever, it seemed, and then it was black belts. Well, I remember when we, just, we were thinking about what are we going to do with high green and low red? What colors were we going to use? And there was like a little fashion show in front with people walking around in belts, and uh, one was a purple belt and one was a brown belt. By adding the brown belt and then the, the dark blue belt, uh, and that helped a lot. Uh, people could realize their goals, so, uh, and they could measure and feel a sense of accomplishment. Central to the convention was the training itself, the opportunity for students, instructors, and masters to join for the first time as World Tung Sudo Association members, practicing forms and techniques. The association also introduced new standardized weapons forms. I have a very vivid recall of the conventions that were held in 1982, 83, 85. Um, some of the fond memories were weapons, and uh, we had introduced the bong forms, the knife form, um, at those conventions. They were introduced. We had no weapons. We had no down gums, no chung gum here, no swords. No knife forms, nothing. All that was new. All that was, was uh, the creation of the, of, of the original Charter Convention. 
After the association's formation, one of the most important early tasks was the standardization of one steps at Hyung. Twenty-five people would sit there for a day or two, and we'd start with number one, what we want number one to look like. Or, in one case, we had, um, I guess, uh, six people charged with you. You take the first five, you take the second five, and come in and let's review them. And that's how we come to the ones today. So over a period of time, we got those three categories of real sushi, kicking hands, and then host and school standardized. So we all know what to do. The association also standardized its forms, unveiling the new Sege Hyung at the 1987 Region 8 Championship. At this championship, history is being made within the World Tang Sudo Association. The Seike Hyungs, or world forms, were introduced. These first three forms of the Hyung system were established by Grand Master J. Chul Shin. The new forms have added kicks along with hand movements. One of the new association's earliest and most important initiatives was the opportunity to take a delegation led by Grand Master Shin to China. The first of many trips was organized in 1984. The China trip was really amazing. There were five of us that went on the first trip, Kwan Jin Im, uh, Master Bowden. Marty Carson was a third degree at that time. Larry Dercole was third degree and I was second degree, so there was five of us that went. When we first went there, we, uh, the first big place that we landed was in Beijing. And so we went to the University of Beijing. And they were doing Wushu at that time. That was the big name was Wushu. Uh, we got to meet uh, Grandmaster Chin of the Chin style, 19th generation, father to son passed down. And we actually got to work with him. Uh, so that was a highlight of that trip. Finally, the long-awaited moment was at hand the opportunity to meet and perform for a living legacy, the abbot and monks of Shaolin. <laughs> Brief and spirited components of Tang Zedou movements were led by Grandmaster Shin, followed by a presentation of the association's flag and other gifts. I remember one time we were in uh, Xi'an and uh, 45 minutes of talking, I realized we were surrounded by uh, 100 people and they were all asking questions by this one person talking to me and I was answering them in my broken English and broken Chinese and they were understanding all these uh, responses and I think that was the best uh, gate opening that we could do uh, to sharing our cultures and understanding each other. So I thought that was a pioneering event. And at the time, I didn't even realize the impact of it. But I was very uh, grateful to have the opportunity. On November 22, 1986, the association gathered at the Philadelphia Civic Center for its first World Championship. Today, youth will play a part. So will experience. It will be an event of international scope with intense competition, but a time where good fellowship is as important as winning. This is the inaugural World Tang Sudo Association Championship. So we did a lot of the behind the scenes work just because we happened to be there and wanted to pitch in and we were too excited to sleep anyway. And so um, it was just leaving, I remember it was about two in the morning, leaving that hall with all the trophies lined up and the banner hung, awaiting the morning to come and the room to fill with contestants was, was just, I remember we both turned around and looked at that hall and saw everything waiting for the first championship to begin. It was really a pretty neat moment. It's like amazing to the Civic Center in Philadelphia. And it was like, oh man, it was just so 
it was neat. <laughs> you know, so many people, and like, first time I ever saw one of the, the giant world tanks with oak flag. That was, that was giant. All the clapping and the yelling and watching the front table. Big banners and everything like that all over from, and everybody from different countries were there. So it was, it was a pretty big tournament. Long time, long, long day tournament. The first view of the championship trophy. But Grandmaster Shin reminds all assembled of the real value of today's event. To achieve something more important than a trophy. It's good control and you don't touch. So keep it techniques from here to here. The World Possible Cup will be presented by Mr. Kenneth Brunel. Kenneth Brunel, please come up and get your love to but it, was a, it was a surprise and, and, and it was an honor at the same time and, and it was something that I, I never thought uh, would happen, being the first one to win. It, it touched me a lot and, and it made me realize that uh, having that kind of honor made me that much stronger when it comes to my life, when it comes to Tongsudo. Not just winning the cup, but <clears throat> what, uh, you know, what it brings when it comes to having that kind of uh, you know, responsibility and leadership. One of the association's greatest accomplishments has been the standardization of Tung Sudo practice, and much of this has been made possible by bringing the Masters together every year at the Masters Clinics. The first clinic was held in 1990 at St. Leo's Abbey near Tampa, Florida. Since 1990, Masters Clinics have expanded to Europe and Latin America. The masters had never gotten together before on a more global basis, and somehow he found the, uh, the location for us in Florida and it turned out to be a really nice event. There we drilled on one young for at least four hours. And, and then we went to the next one after lunch. And then we went to the next one the next day. And what we were doing is trying to get everybody's ideas around the world. You know, what do we want to make? So we all do it similarly. So no matter where I go and I train, then we're training, we can train, uh, we know what we're doing, and we can just take the level up a notch because we know the basic core concepts and the basic core moves of all the young. So we dedicated more than one clinic to that. So as the masters, each year we come together, haven't seen each other for a year, we greet one another and we share information of what's been going on in the past year, the previous year. And again, the same cliche of individually, we're special. When you go to your school, I'm special at my school, Star Karate. He's special at his school, whatever school may be. But when we come together, we lose the ego of our schools. We lose, we lose the ego of we're being the leaders, and now we become white belts again. And question number said several times that we develop masters. Masters just automatically happen. We actually train and create masters. The Tang Su is always growing. You think you know so much, and you come to a class like this, and somebody else comes in and shows you something, you think that is totally new, and you take that back with you. So that's something else for you to practice and learn with and teach and show. And they come the next year and something else there. There's never an end to it. This is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it is humbling to have the opportunity to train with Grandmaster Shen, with the Masters of the Association, and the other members that are here. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to do that. And I feel richer for it. I feel challenged by it. And it's something that helps me uh, when I go back to my studio with my students, it's something that, that it, it warms me from within to help to share with them. It's amazing, you know, I know people tell you, oh, you're going to be expected to, to, to bond and to, you know, brotherhood, teamwork, and you, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this, but you really don't know until you get here and experience it. It's, you know, it, it's just something, wait till you get here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Over its 25 years, the World Hung Sudo Association has expanded in a host of ways, reaching out to new faces, opening its doors and its arms to all who wanted to study the martial arts. We've kind of opened uh, the martial arts up to many, many different people. When I trained initially in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it might have been 70% adults, 30% kids. The thought of having 20, 25, 30 tiny tigers in a class, little dragons in a class, that wasn't happening, at least in our area in, in the 70s. Um, so that's a significant thing because we've opened it up to uh, anyone who thinks they want to try and can, and can do well. I think that's really, I think that's our, our secret to success. We accept everyone. We have grown a lot with studios, clubs, and members, but we've also grown in areas that other organizations have not. We do not stress the kicking and the punching and just the physical side. Grandmaster Shin has done so much for our members by introducing the children's program the program for seniors, the Qigong program, and the other side of the spiritual and mental art that a lot of organizations do not even delve into, let alone explore the way that we have. As the association has grown and evolved, Grandmaster Shin has worked to organize association principles and practices and to publish an important series of books on topics ranging from philosophy to advanced technique. The books made all the difference in the world. And I mean, across the world. There was a body of principles that you could actually learn and uh, um, the association could hold you accountable for. I've seen students that have been more educated uh, in the process and, and they're able to um, actually explain what it is that they're studying. As the association progresses and, and the average age gets a little older and uh, the experience level increases, that's going to play a more important part sometimes in the physical training. The association was global from the start, with representatives from 12 countries at the Charter Convention. But over the past 25 years, it has brought an ever-increasing number of nations into the Tung Sudo family. 25 years has brought <clears throat> a huge world and made it smaller because we know each other globally. That was just a half year after our convention. So that started in Germany and so that was my first club. And over the years, so now we are by 12 clubs. Grandmaster came in November 85. We had about 100 at that time, but a year later we had 1,000. Uh, and we grew and we grew and we grew. And right now we have 2,000 students. Um, we have uh, seven masters, two master candidates, and over 45 clubs. Mexico is probably the most uh, populated uh, uh, as far as membership is concerned, we have the longest history in Mexico compared to the other countries in the region. Uh, Argentina would be after that, uh, and then there is uh, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, and, and then it's Costa Rica, and now Nicaragua and Panama are, are coming into the uh, picture. Y también hay que, hay que ver algo muy importante, la asociación eh, creció eh, en base a un carácter firme. Y tener... He said he learned by the association the way they do things. Their organization is growing a lot in Argentina because the World Tanzu Association, how they believe on making the techniques better, how to make everybody be together, and how they keep working. Casi 22 años, 22 años de... He said thanks to the, the organization because it's been in Mexico for a long time, since, since uh, 1982 with the first visit for Grandmaster Shin to, to Sinaloa, Mexico. And he said thanks to that is why the organization is keep growing and, and it's getting better. In the region, pues de nosotros depende que la region crezca, que la region eche hacia adelante. Ya gracias. He has been actively working on Region 18. Uh, that's Region 18 is the Caribbean, where there was a clinic that he manages to put together on a cruise ship. And he goes around to the different islands 
and uh, does demonstrations and has their their clinics actually on the beaches in the different islands in that area. He feels that that's a really uh, positive way to get uh, to get the other little islands in that area to be involved in Region 18. I started from the ground. The Mozambique Tongue Sudo Association, it's growing big. We have about 140 active members and we're running a children's program and we have about 100 of them. So it's, it's going great, it's going great. So we're making two different countries at one time one. So the World Tongue Sudo Association is a channel of connection between countries, people. Of all of the association's accomplishments over 25 years, one of the greatest has been in bringing people together as a family. You go to a world championship and look out on the floor, over half the floor is black belts. So people stay. They stay because it's a family atmosphere. They, they stay in it because they can bring their families into it and they feel secure by doing that. They know that they're going to be treated right, their kids are going to have values that they agree with. I have seen children come into this organization as students. Their parents put them in just as something to do one or two days a week, maybe get a little self-confidence out of it. And then after a few months, the mother says, you know what, this is something I want to do. And then the father sees the mother and the children in there, and this has grown exponentially. We have family members that are now, their children are testing as master. This is what we are. This is what we try to tell everyone. Family is very important. You have to love what you do. And if you can do martial arts with your family and make it better for them and your students, you fulfilled all the goals. It's great to have something in common with your whole family that you all like to do and that you can all do at once. You get support um, in your martial arts training that you might not get if the rest of your family wasn't going through what you were going through. It kept us all healthy, but at the same time it helped us all grow in different ways and become a stronger unit. Martial arts is, is really important and I think it helps that uh, we're able to train together um, so there's more of a draw for us to, to continue and to participate. I mean, it's, it's no longer just an activity, it's just part of what we do um, and makes our family stronger. Children are the future of Tung Sudo, and the association has designed the Tiny Tigers and Little Dragons programs for children three to seven years old. Kids, I mean, first of all, they have energy. Uh, they're very flexible, they're very talented, they catch on quickly. And our programs are developed in such a way where within five minutes you can have a five-year-old doing a high block and a center punch and a front kick and smiling. And doing it, you know, they're doing it well. Ready? Stop. This is the first year that the Tiny Tigers and Little Dragons have competed at a world level. Working with the Tiny Tigers, obviously at a young age, it's important to keep them moving, to keep them fast paced, and just kind of go out and have fun. But we are working on the basics, respect, uh, the beginning form stage, and I think most importantly just to make sure that they have fun while they're out there. So far from what we've done today, it was a big success. It went very well. Everybody have fun? Everybody do their best? Put your right hands up. 
Alright, we're gonna be super loud now. When I count three, you gotta say tongue soup. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Give yourself a big clap. It is the traditional responsibility of the martial artist to provide protection and aid to those in need, and the association has given that mission a 21st century form in the creation of the World Tungsudo Foundation. The idea came from the mottos of the World Tungsudo Association, uh, brotherhood, unity. Community service is a very big part of being a black belt. Black belts are supposed to give of themselves to their students, to their families, to the community. This is what the foundation helps to espouse. We realized we had been doing what true martial art is, and the spirit of being able to take care of your brother, that's what it's about. We have the community service division, which assists in raising monies for other charities, cleaning highways, doing reading programs, for schools, helping in self-defense. Humanitarian aid, the Katrina effort that we did, we consistently give money to the Dominican Republic to help the children there. We collect uniforms for the students in Mozambique who cannot afford them. We have many members who give funds so that the students in South Africa can go through the system of World Tong Sudo. Taking school supplies and hygiene kits to uh... Uh, orphans uh, overseas, uh, when they don't have anything, it's a big deal to them. The scholarship program which was initiated was to help our members to gain knowledge in other areas besides martial arts so that they can bring that knowledge into the martial arts. We have the building fund which is main goal is to find and finance the location for our new headquarters. People have already been putting their energy there, donating their money, trying to build this building one brick at a time, as Master Shin says. I think it doesn't matter where it is or what it is. I think as long as it's there and it's some place that we can call home. And when you first walk into that place, which is going to be the New World Headquarters, when you first walk into there, you're going to say, this is home. You won't ever have to worry about where home is for the rest of your life, so to speak. It's a new direction for us, but yeah, a new, new chapter to open up with the World Tongue Sudo Association. The foundation of true martial arts helping one another, that's the foundation. That's the spirit of the foundation. Every two years since 1986, the association has come together to celebrate in a championship that has blossomed to more than 3,500 competitors and families in 2006. The first one had this feeling that everything was about to begin and it was the birth of something new and it was just exciting to be part of it. 88 was great because we were back again, another year, bigger and better. And so it felt like the start of it all. Over the years, it's really grown. The spirit is stronger. You know, there's a, a lot more competitors, a lot more students, a lot more black belts, a, a lot more instructors, a lot more masters, uh, more schools from all over the world. And for me, I'm, I'm just honored to be, to be part of that. The 86 championships, at midnight, we, you were still sparring. You know, now we're doing 2,000 people and we're done by early evening. It became from a one-day event to this two-day, to this three-day event, to now it's a vacation time. So a big difference, big difference. Again, that's the evolution. At the tournaments, the winning of the trophy isn't the most important thing. That the, keeping the values, keeping the tradition of respect and etiquette is the, the important thing at those kind of events. And by doing that, it creates the family atmosphere. Uh, you see at our tournaments, people uh, that are competing against each other, becoming great friends, hugging each other, they're supporting each other. Uh, that, I think, is real important and unique about what we do. In 1992, the growing role of women in the organization was marked by the introduction of a women's and men's cup. In 2006, youth and senior divisions were added to accommodate the expanding scope of the championship. Just going to the World Championships uh, and seeing all the cup winners over the years, they are so respectful and they're so modest and they're so humble when it comes to winning a cup. And over the years, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, the cup winners have that kind of humility inside them. 
and I think uh, the spirit is still there with all the contestants. Twenty-five years of traditionalism, twenty-five years of professionalism, twenty-five years of brotherhood, a legacy, and a prologue. Twenty-five years doesn't seem that long, but so much has happened during that time. It was such a family, and it is still that way today. It's just much larger. Well, I think it all goes back to quenching him, making him grandmaster was certainly the best idea we ever had. <laughs> Because he's, he's kind of what, what drives this organization, I think. You know, even though what's a lot of people help him, and I think he's actually the, the heart and soul of this organization. Traveling, the things he does, the way he can relate to people. I just want to see the art grow and, and spread, and, and uh, I want to sit back and I want to just say, wow, 1982, look where we are now. We need good students that become good instructors, good masters to replace us, so that organization continues to grow. Cause Grandmaster Shin has put a lot of time, he actually has put his whole life into this organization and that's what he is looking at us for, to make sure that we are teaching our students the right way. When you put your mind to it, when you really believed in it, it worked. You did it a traditional way. Now you can take that same thing and apply it to whatever you want to achieve in life. If you, whatever you want to do, just do it the right way, at the right time, in the right manner, and this is what you're going to get. That's what the Grand Master has shown us. That's what I'm trying to pass on. I call it tradition. And martial arts training gives people the opportunity to become their greater self. Through the small achievements that they have in the dojang, they build the discipline and the capability to become a better self. And I think that's what Tung Sudo as a martial art has to offer, and that's why it will be here 50 years from now. Grandmaster Shen, when he started this organization. He wanted to bring what was important to him to the rest of the world. We continue to do that through our member studios and our members. We continue to help them to become better people and to make everyone around them who comes in contact with them better people. That's our legacy, making this world a better place.